Today, spring break, a lot of people are traveling, so I thought we would go on a little bit of a road trip ourselves. So, we're going to travel to three places in the next few minutes together. First of all, we're going to go to a birthday party across the pond in England. Then, we're going to travel to the streets of Athens, Greece. Then, we'll come back to the United States and end up on the edge of a cliff. First of all, let's go to England. Many years ago, uh, Bertrand Russell, who was a very renowned atheist and philosopher and public intellectual, he was having his 90th birthday. And at that gathering of a group of friends there in England, one of his buddies said, hey, Bertie, what are you going to do if you die in a few years and you find out that you were wrong. What are you going to do if you die and there is a God? What are you going to say to him? And Bertrand Russell said, I'm going to say to him, you gave us insufficient evidence. Insufficient evidence. In other words, if God would have given him more evidence or sufficient evidence, he would have believed. Now, there are a lot of Skeptics, maybe not as scholarly as Bertrand Russell, but many skeptics who feel the same way. So one of the questions I want to explore here today is the issue of evidence. Does God give us evidence of his existence? And what I want to share with you is some compelling evidence that I've discovered over the years, I've read about. And so hopefully when you leave here today, that you will leave here with great confidence that the Christian worldview has deep intellectual roots. And maybe if you're a skeptic and you're looking for evidence, perhaps the evidence we're going to look at in our travels here today uh, will draw you one step closer to belief in God. So let's start right here in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to go all the way to Revelation 20. No, I'm teasing. (laughs) People, where's the exit? Okay. Genesis 1, 1. Let's read it and then let's think about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Theologians refer to this verse as God creating the universe ex nihilo out of nothing. So it makes logical sense, at least to me, if God did make everything that we can see, things that we can't see that are beyond us, if God made everything, then his fingerprints should be all over creation. Evidence of his existence. So, One form of evidence that that we can see that I would want to share with the esteemed Dr. Russell at his birthday party, if I would have been invited, would have been that there's a lot of scientific evidence for the existence of God. One place we can see that is in the Big Bang Theory. Not the TV show, but the actual scientific theory. For many, many years, cosmologists believed that the, the universe has always existed. There was an an eternality to the universe. It simply always was, if you would. But Big Bang cosmologists and scientists believed through studying that the universe actually had a beginning. So there was a time when it was not. So they caused this beginning of time, the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. Now, Dr. Stephen Hawking, who was a theoretical physicist, said this about it. He said, people do not like the idea that time has a beginning, probably because it smacks of divine intervention. So the Big Bang really comports well with Genesis 1-1, God speaking, God creating the universe. And if you're a skeptic and say, well, I believe in the Big Bang Theory, but you have to have someone who pulled the trigger. So Big Bang, Big Bang cosmology, and understanding that really points to the God that we know, the God of the Bible. Also in science, we have the fine-tuning 
of the universe. And the fine-tuning of the universe refers to the vast number of variables and calculations and calibrations that had to be precisely fine-tuned to allow for life to even exist. Now, let's look at this picture right here. Uh, look at this slide on the screens. That's a cockpit, check that out, of a 747 aircraft. Isn't that amazing? There are close to a thousand different buttons, levers, and gauges right there. Now, for a pilot to get that plane off of the ground, he or she has to calibrate all those levers, all those dials, all those things in a precise manner in order to get the plane off the ground. And then once they want to land the plane, they have to recalibrate those levers in a certain way to allow us to land safely in the city of our destination. So by way of analogy, if it takes that much complexity to get a plane off the ground and to land a plane safely, how much more complexity, how much more fine-tuning did there have to be at the beginning of the universe to produce what we know as life? And how is life sustained? This precarious, magical spot we have here on planet Earth and the environment that we live in. Dr. Hugh Ross, who is a friend of mine, an astrophysicist from Sierra Madre, California, puts it this way. He said, unless the number of electrons is equivalent to the number of protons to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 37th power or better, then electric magnet, electromagnetic forces in the universe would have so overcome gravitational forces that galaxies, stars, planets would have never formed. I know you're thinking, it's spring break, not <laughs> science. I know. But it's, but it's amazing, isn't it? When you think about all those things, and you look at a quote like that from someone who studied it their whole life, like Dr. Ross, and you think about how unbelievable the fine-tuning of the universe is, it shows us that there is a ultimate, powerful, fine-tuner, which is God himself. Another example of scientific evidence for God would be the irreducible complexity of life in some microbiological systems. This is a term coined by Michael Behe, and Behe describes irreducible complexity in this way, and I think I can, I can bring it down. By irreducibly complex, I mean a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of those parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. So in other words, in some systems in biology, as, as we study that, they are irreducibly complex. So in other words, for them, for them to have evolved over a whole lot of time and gradually, that would be impossible because the whole system would, would break down. It's like having an engine to a car. You know, all the parts have to be there in place for that engine to work. It's the same thing in microbiological systems. So that points to, right, obviously a designer in what we understand as we study biology. Now, an, an example we could understand, I think, is more of, say, the computer world. Just imagine if you have a laptop computer, okay? So you, you go home, you take your laptop. By the way, be careful with your laptop computer. Don't lose those things. So, so if you have your laptop computer, go find a small Phillips head screwdriver and just take off the back of your laptop and look at all the intricacy and look at all the wires and look at all the chips and ask yourself the question, what happened? Do you look at that, and, and, and as you're working on your computer, and look at the back of it, kind of what's going on, and go, wow, that, that's an amazing accident. That just, there, there must have been some explosion at a scrap metal yard in Sealy, and somehow <laughs> these things just kind of, no, no one thinks that. You think, wow. This is intricately designed. It is fine-tuned for the purposes that we can use it for. Someone had to design it. Design, anywhere we see it in nature or technology, cries out for a designer. I mean, if we were to take another trip, you know, not just to England and, you know, wherever, we could go to, say, I don't know, Big Ben, and we're stumbling around, and we find 
on the ground an arrowhead, something as simple as an arrowhead. We're not going to think, wow, <laughs> that just happened, you know. Some, this arrowhead was just, you know, through tornadoes and windstorms and sand and time and accidents. Man, no, we're going to think something as simple as an arrowhead. We're going to think, you know, some member of a tribe many years ago designed that arrowhead for a purpose. So design cries out for a designer. Okay? So we can see the fingerprints of God, the evidence of God's existence and his creative powers within nature and with the irreducible complexity we find there as we study it. One scientist put it this way, a biochemist. He said that science is distilled doxology. It's distilled doxology. It's another means as we study it, as we investigate, as we continue to discover, we can see the handiwork, the beauty, and the creation, and the power of God himself. Psalm 19.1 says this. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the works of his hands. How do, we, how do we know that there's a God? How do we know that God exists? We can simply walk around and look at this incredibly diverse, beautiful, magical world that we live in. So not only is there cogent evidence, there's overwhelming evidence that God is real, that God exists. Now, let's travel now to Athens, Greece. We're leaving the birthday party. Let's go to Athens, Greece, and let's look and talk to another public intellectual that we're probably more familiar with by the name of Paul of Tarsus. Paul was a guy who used to really hate and abhor people like you and me, or most of us here, who would consider ourselves to be Christians. Paul saw it as his intellectual and personal mission in life to wipe out anybody who believed in Christ. But he had a radical conversion experience. You may call it a Damascus Road experience. And he changed his mind. He changed the focus of his life. He went from being a persecutor of the Christian faith to being a proclaimer of the Christian faith. And he started gatherings of people, groups of people, like churches, to learn how to understand God in Christ. So now he finds himself in Athens, Greece, Right? This is the hotbed of philosophy of Plato, Aristotle, Zeno, the Stoics. And let's see what Paul does as he's seeking to present God, his existence, and God and how he's revealed himself in Christ. Look at Acts chapter 17. It says, while Paul was waiting for them, he's waiting for Timothy and Silas, I believe, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with them. He reasoned in the synagogue with them. It does not say, he said, well, I can't explain it all. You just got to have faith. <laughs> you know, you just have to have, I know it sounds crazy. Just have faith, you people in the synagogue. No, that's not what it says, is it? Oh, no. It said that he reasoned with them in the synagogues, both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate him. Some of them said, what is this babbler trying to say? So Paul is taking the message of God, his existence, the evidence of God. He's taking the message of the gospel, the good news about what God has done in Christ, into the synagogue, outside the synagogue, into the streets, and then into these public debates with other people who see the world and have ideas and philosophies entirely different from his. And he's trying to persuade them. He's trying to reason with them. And in that, he's using a different type of evidence that I would call philosophical evidence for the existence of God and the veracity, if you would, of the Christian faith. So there are different types of philosophical evidence. One line of reasoning or argumentation will be known as the cosmological argument. The word cosmology, cosmos, means world or order. Lo, you know, ology or logos means reason. So cosmology gives the reason for the universe's existence, okay? 
cause, what, you know, cosmology, you could call it that. What are the causes? So if we were to walk outside today after the service and we look around, what we would see, you know, grass and we would see trees, we would see bushes and flowers, we would see clouds, hopefully we're going to see the sun today. You know, we would see all these things. And then we would see people, and we would see cars, and we would see buildings. We would see neighborhoods and homes. And if we started to think about these things that we see, we would realize that everything that we see is contingent. Everything that we see requires something else for its existence. Everything that we see, including the universe itself, had a time when it did not exist. So if you keep on playing the game of contingency, in cosmology, you come to the conclusion that there has to be an uncaused cause. There has to be a non-contingent being, or as some would call him, a higher power that got the universe going. So this argument for the existence of God was used by you know, Plato and by Aristotle, uh, as well as Aquinas and others. It's called the cosmological argument for God's existence. And it points to a being that is uncaused, beginningless, spaceless, timeless, and enormously powerful enough to create this contingent world that we all live in. Also, philosophically, there's a transcendental argument. And that's kind of the line of reasoning that Paul used here in Acts chapter 17. We don't have to get into it. We started to debate with these philosophers. And the transcendental argument is a little more difficult to grasp, in my opinion, but it, it, it says this. It says that only the Christian worldview provides the necessary preconditions for intelligibility in order that you can do logic, do science, and have absolute moral values. In other words, if you're going to engage in using your mind and using reason and doing math and doing science and having absolute moral truth and values, you have to be able to ground your logic, ground your reasoning, ground your science, ground your art in something beyond you. And the only worldview that makes sense that allows you to do that, according to the transcendental argument, is the Christian worldview. Now, I was first exposed to this line of argument about I don't know, 20 plus years ago, and I was listening to a debate. If you want to listen to it, you can Google it and listen to it. A debate between Bonson, B-A-H-S-E-N, versus Stein, S-T-E-I-N. And it was over the topic. It's a formal debate. Over the topic, does God exist? And in this debate, Bonson uses the transcendental line of argument in order to prove or give evidences for God's existence. It's a very compelling debate. I remember listening to it with my dad some 20 years ago, and our, our minds literally just, just exploded, right? Because we'd never heard anything like it. So if you want to check that out, you can. It'll give you more information about that particular line of philosophical reason. Another form of philosophical evidence or reasoning is, is the moral argument, Okay. In other words, do moral absolutes and objective moral values exist? Is there a sense in all cultures and all time, a sense of being right and wrong? C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, opens up talking about the Tao, T-A-O, how we all have a sense of these absolute objective morals inside of us. Philosopher Immanuel Kant talked about the moral imperative that exists in all people. So if there are absolute moral truths, then that begs the question that there has to be a transcendent absolute moral truth standard or moral truth giver who is God himself. So the, the, the idea that morals are relative is absolutely erroneous. And some of the people who are preaching so hard for relativism are some of the most absolute intolerant people I've ever encountered in my entire life. So there is great philosophical evidence, I think, in arguing for evidences for God. Cosmological, transcendental, the moral argument is simply one. And what's behind all these two different categories of evidence, both scientific evidence and philosophical evidence, is that it's pointing to God, the God of the Bible, as the 
ultimate source of everything. God is not some glorified father figure. He's not some old man upstairs. No, God is the ground of all being. He is the mind of all minds. He is the power that spoke everything we see into existence. He is the one that undergirds everything in our life and sustains our life and our world and the universe and the multiverses that exist out there. God is behind it all and through it all. And in this message in Acts chapter 17, Paul talked about that to this group of philosophers and Epicureans and Stoics. He said, hey, you're poets. Your own people said it's in him we live and move and have our being. He said, we're all God's offspring. We're all God's children in blue suede shoes. And God has, that's the message translation, and God has revealed himself to us through what is made. He made everything. He made you. He made me. And he's also come down to us and revealed himself to us up close and personal by sending his son, Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm here to talk about Christ. Christ is the face of the almighty creator God. And he goes on to say, hey, you can have a relationship with this God. He's near to you. You can cry out to him. You can ask him to rescue you, to save you, to forgive you, and you'll enter into a relationship with this God who made everything by his grace and mercy that he revealed to you in Christ. Talk more about that next week. But the third line of of evidence is also, it's amazing, it's called intrinsic evidence, and that's what John Calvin called the sensus divinitatis. In other words, that God has pre-installed inside of all human beings this sense of the divine. And just like we have eyes that we can see the external world around us, we have these internal eyes that sense God's presence, that sense the reality of the existence of God. So I think Ecclesiastes says, eternity is written on the heart of every man and every woman. It's written on our heart. That's why we have this thirst and desire for knowledge. That's why we have this thirst and desire to try to understand God. So there's intrinsic evidence that's internal, that's inside of us, that makes us aware of the reality of God. Now, I don't think that if I could go to the birthday party with Bertrand Russell, if I could go to Mars Hill in Athens with Paul and just stack the evidence up. Man, look at the scientific evidence, the evidence in nature. Look at the philosophical arguments. The more, look at all these things that folks there that were skeptical would go, oh, you got me, you know, uncle, I give up. And, you know, you brought me to my intellectual knees. You know, I believe, I, you know, I don't, I don't I don't believe that. I don't believe that you can argue someone into belief in God or argue someone into Christianity. I do think giving giving reasons, as Paul did, as I'm attempting to do today, are very important. And many times God can use these reasons, he can use evidence to soften our heart and awaken us to the reality of who he is. But I don't want you to leave your thinking, you know, you can just, if you would just think a little bit, right, you know, you can reason your way all the way to heaven. I don't, I don't believe that. I, I believe in doubt. I mean, I wrote my, my doctoral thesis on doubt. I wrote a book on doubt. So I don't, I understand that as human beings that we have a lot of uncertainty. We have doubts. But we need to learn how to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs and pursue the questions that we're asking. Paul was great at doing that. So many people in God's word were great at doing that. We have such a long line of men and women, scientists and philosophers and theologians who have worked diligently to provide a very strong foundation for the beliefs that we hold, for the beliefs that we take out into our schools and into the marketplace where we live. I read a story recently about a guy by the name of uh, Cy Gart, who's a biochemist, third-generation atheist, 
his parents were members of the Communist Party in the 1930s. That's pretty, that's pretty hardcore atheist materialist. He went to become a professor at NYU and at Rutgers. But as he began to study actually more of the science in his case, as he studied abiogenesis, as he studied quantum physics, as he looked at the fine-tuning, he moved from atheism, not believing in God, to agnosticism, being open to the possibility that there's a God. And then someone eventually gave him a Bible, and he started actually reading in the book of Acts. And somewhere along the way in his journey on his own trip, Sai had a dream. Amazing, a dream. And in this dream, he was hanging from the edge of a cliff. And as he was hanging from the edge of the cliff, he was crying out for help. He goes, help, help. And as he cried out, he heard a voice say, let go. And Sai said to himself, I can't let go. If I let go, I'll fall hundreds of feet and die. And the voice said again, let go. Let go. So he held on and held on until finally, in this dream of his, he just let go. And when he let go, he said the landscape just flipped 90 degrees, and he was on the ground, and he was alive, and there was a man standing right by there, the man whose voice told him to let go. And he's awakened from the dream, and he's began to reflect back on that. He realized that the man calling him was Christ himself, and he realized that he was calling him to let go. Just let go of all the barriers that had prevented him from actually trusting and entering into a relationship with God in Christ. And many years ago, Sai let go. Not only did he come to believe in God, but he asked Christ to come into his life and ended up writing a book called The Works of His Hands, A Scientific Atheist Quest to God. It's amazing how God can draw us into a relationship with him through scientific evidence, through philosophy, sometimes through a dream, through an invitation to a church service, to a time of crisis. God draws him and draws us to himself. Why? He wants us to have a second birthday party. <laughs> he wants us to understand, to know what it means to be born again. Would you pray with me? God, we love you so much. And God, we thank you that we are not alone in this universe. We're not alone in this place here today, that you are truly with us. God, we come into relationship with you in so many different ways through science, through dreams, through friends, through just being to a point of desperation in our lives. You bring us into a relationship with you. Father, I pray if there's someone here who's like Sai or like others here who need a touch of your grace, they need to enter into a relationship with you. They need to understand what it means to be born again. God, may they stand to come down front today. May they stand. Give them that, that courage to stand and to walk down front and to begin to understand your purpose, your plan for their life. God, others here are Christians. They're following you. They know you. They love you. They're simply looking for a place where they can connect and belong. You're leading the second. God, may they stand and come and make their way down front. And join this, your church family today. This is our prayer. We give you this time of invitation. We ask these things in Jesus' name.